So I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's show. Um, good evening and welcome. Uh, tonight's going to be a special uh, Hanukkah show. I'd like to thank Mayor Gabba and Jonari for arranging the show. Um, and I would like to dedicate um, tonight's show. Amen. Um, and also, I'd like to dedicate a show for all the sick people in Am Israel, um, including for Ashlema for Gravelen and Batlia Malka, Alisha Bacha Batrivka, Jenny Batrozet, and Claudine Batran Ruhama. And um, also, Mao, your son's name, Yaeli. Yali Tzemach Ben Avishak Tova. Yali Tzemach Ben Avishak Tova. Kel Narafan Alem Fuat Nevesh Ufuat Aguf Ufuat Kruva Lavo. Amen. Amen. Okay, so tonight we've got a lot to cover. Um, Parashat Vayeshev and Chanukah tomorrow night. So everyone is excited for Chanukah. Um, so we're going to start a little bit off with the parasha, and then we're going to do a lot the main show about uh, Chanukah. So. So, so this this week's parasha, and of course, every time when there's a parasha, uh, there's a, a chag in, in the week of a parasha. It's always going to be connected to the parasha. Uh, that is the insult we learn from the the Shlach Kadosh, the pre pre tzedek Rabbi Tzadok Milublin brings it down. And every year, I study the parasha and I find a new connection to the to the chag of Hanukkah, because always you see the. Chag of Hanukkah falls in the parashat of Vayeshev and Miketz. So, one connection, and this is my own observations, and this is a beautiful idea I would like to share with you. Two, two new connections to Hanukkah. Oh, it's all, it's a mild connection, I'll admit it. But nevertheless, it's connected. So, we're talking about Yosef and his dreams. So, uh, Yosef was hated by his brothers, as it was traditional since the creation of brothers. Kain and Hevel, they hated each other. Ishmael and Yitzchak, Ishmael hated uh, Yitzchak, Esav and Yaakov, and following in the tradition, the brothers and Yosef. And of course, on a simple level, it just looks like simple brother rivalry. However, the Chida explains they had very deep, uh, deep, deep calculations and motivations according to, to what they thought was really the right thing to do L'Shem Shemayim. They thought Yosef was a type of uh, Esav. Um, and, uh, and they thought that, you know, he had to be killed. That's how they decided. That's what they thought that was right, Minash So I'm not going to go into it that, but I just want to bring your attention to one Pasuk where Yosef is about to be thrown into the pit. And Oven comes up to save him. And this is the line of Oven. Yeah, they saw him from far away. He's coming towards them, and they were actually talking about him. What, what's the right thing to do? But they wanted to kill him. Here comes the boy with the dreams. Let's go and kill him, and then we'll just throw him into one of the, the, the pits. That's what they said. And now here comes the big line for Reuven, and this is really where Reuven comes onto the stage. In the parasha, what did Reuven do? He just made a suggestion. He says, Let's not kill him. Don't spill blood. Put him into the pit. Don't kill him. So the, the Torah testifies. That Ruven made the political move. He was said, he's like very diplomatic. He said, listen, this is not right. I, I need to bring him back to my father, but I can't directly go against all my brothers. You know, the big Tadikim, all of them. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to buy time. I'm going to convince them not to kill him directly and just put him into the, into the bowl, into the pit, just for time keeping. And then later on, I'll come back and bring him back to his father and then things will calm down. And that's in fact what he did. But while he was gone, Yehuda took him out the bar, the pit, the bar and uh, the pit and sold him to the Midianim, and that's how he got down to Mitzrayim. 
But the point is over here, and this is a, a midrash, that Yehovah comes to fame just because of this line. He said, let's try and, he just wanted to save him, and he made an effort to save him. He found the courage to tell his brothers, listen, let's just put, not kill him directly. Let's leave him up to nature. We'll put him in a pit. And if he gets killed, then it's Minash he gets killed. And if he gets saved, that's all Mishnah Shemaim. Let's not spill instant blood. And the, the, the Torah talks one, two, three, maybe four psukim, two or three psukim about Reuven. And, they, and the Torah testifies he's the one who saved Yosef. And he gets reward for this. And then we share with you the Midrash in the root. Amar Abi Yitzchak Bar Marion. Maybe I've mentioned this before. But this everyone should know when you do a mitzvah, there's somebody watching and you will be rewarded for it. And, it's gonna, and you should do the mitzvah wholeheartedly and you should do b'simcha. When a person here is in this world, everything that we have belongs to our Baruch Hu, right? We said, Telo Mishelo, ki ata v'shelcha shelo. Ki mimcha akol. What are you going to do? You're going to give a tar- charity to our Baruch Hu? You're going to give him 10% of your money. Well, where does your money come from? It comes from him. So you take from him 100, you give him back 10. Well, you haven't given him anything. You're going to put on tefillin. Well, who gave you the tefillin? Who gave you the arm to put on tefillin? Who gave you the head to put the tefillin on? What can you do to give to our Kodesh Baruch Hu? But when you do it in mitzvah and you do it with simcha, with a heart, that's what you can give to our Kodesh Baruch Hu. That's the feeling of your heart. It says the Midrash, and this is really a beautiful Midrash. Midrash says, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak Bar Marion, Ba katuf lelamdecha, Shuim adam oseh mitzvah, Yasenu belevav shalem. You do it with your whole heart. Sheilu haya reuven, Yodea asha kadosh baruchu mechtiv alav. If reuven knew that we're going to start, sit down here, in the December 2020, on Zoom, and we're going to read the Psukim about Reuven saving Yosef. We're going to read the Torah every every week in Shabbat for generations, in every synagogue around the world. If he knew that, that's what we're going to write about him. He would have lifted them up straight away on his shoulders and taken him straight to his father. Now, what does that mean? He does it for the glory. You know, what do people do to get recognized? Okay, so people have a, a desire for fame, mm-hmm. to be on the news, to be talked about, to be read about. But people also want to be on Facebook and people but, want but, to be... But is it in the opposite? Like, oh, well, actually, Reuven did, did it L'shem Shamaim. He said, well, you cannot oh, do right. something that... So he didn't do it for any recognition or no, any kavod or so, any... So absolutely right. Let me just quote you Rashi. He really wanted to save him. And he said, I'm going to be blamed for this. I'm the oldest. And if I don't save him, I'll be blamed. And even the Pasuk says, He really wanted to save him, genuinely. But he didn't know that he's going to be recognized for it. That means, Gilad, when you wake up anymore, you come to the Shio, yeah? Okay. So you give up, you turn off your phone. Yeah, you say goodbye to your family. I got one, give me one hour. I'm running to right now. So you did that, Lashem Shemaim. You didn't do that to be recognized. No one's going to write that in a newspaper. Yeah. Right? That's why you did it. But if you know that we're going to make a big deal out of it, right? You do more simcha. And that's what the Midrash says about Reuven. Of course, it's still Lashem Shemaim. But it says also about Aaron Akwen. Ilu aya yodea Aaron. So God is going to write about him. Hineu yotze likratecha. When Aaron's younger brother, Moshe Rabbeinu, was appointed to be leader of Am Yisrael, he went out to greet him, to welcome him. He didn't know the Torah was going to write about it. If he would have known, he would have come out with a band, with the drums and singing. Yeah. He would have done it with more simcha. And it says the same thing about Boaz. And then the Midrash says a line. Listen to this line. Rabbi Yakoen, Rabbi Yoshua, B'Shem Rabbi Levi. So in the times of the Torah, in the times of the Navi, if you do the mitzvah, then the Torah writes about you, or the Navi is going to write about you, like in Megillat Rot, about Boaz who gave Rot food. Now, 
Now that we do a mitzvah, who's going to write about it? Yeah, no, no, you, no, you do a mitzvah, you help out, you hear your friend uh, is in hospital, you go visit him. You, need, you heard someone is in uh, quarantine, you help them with food. You had a synagogue meet something, you're going to help them out. Uh, your wife is not feeling well, you make a dinner. Okay. you done a mitzvah. Who's going to write about it? You. You're going to write about it? You're going to make yeah. a personal diary? I'll write about it. Okay, that's one approach. What? Well, you're the, you're the Hashem. Hashem is going to write. Who said Hashem? Mayor. Mayor. Well, in the Torah, everything is written, right? In the times of the Navi, all the major events are also written down. Says the Midrash. Nowadays, when Adam, Adam, this is Lashon Midrash, Adam was a mitzvah. Mi kotvua, who's going to write it? Says the Midrash, Eliyahu kotva. Eliyahu, Eliyahu Navi, is going to write it down. O Melech HaMashiach ve HaKadosh Baruch Hu chotem al yedehem. Comes Melech HaMashiach, he's going to write it. Vahaw dekhtib, az nidberu yere Hashem ishel ka'ehu. That's a pasuk in Melachi. Soon Mashiach was going to come, he's going to take out a book, and yeah, everything is going to be up to date, everything that you've done, which is progress and brought us near to Mashiach, it's going to be documented. And there's just something to think about next time we're going to do a mitzvah, and it takes extra effort to do it because it's the effort that, can't, that you put into the mitzvah to do it with your whole heart, that's what counted. And it just occurred to me that this is maybe a connection to the Hanukkah story because. What was the story of Hanukkah? The Hanukkah was that the Greeks, they just impured, impured everything, made everything impure. They just uh, touched it with the, with the impurities. When somebody touches dead body, it becomes impure. Then you touch the oil, the oil is impure. They impurified all the oils. That means they were still freshly crisp, good quality olive oil, but not kasher, le mahadrin, for the menorah. And they went out of the way. You know, you search. How long can you look for? You look, you look, you look. You don't find. Okay. But honest, but you made the extra effort to find. They said there must be one. They looked over the old Bet Midash, the Hobbit Mikdash, all the ruins. You know, you know, when you're looking for something in your house and everything's organized and tidy, then you find it quickly. But if everything's a big mess and you just try to find one thing, it takes a lot of much longer and uh, it's frustrating and you yeah, just give up. But that made the effort. Because the effort, extra effort that they made, they eventually found one. Not only that they found one, but a miracle was made by it. And I would like to share with you the following story. And this is really fundamental to Judaism. Um, tonight is the Yod site and Hirula of Aaron Yudeleib Steinman. He was Rosh Hashiva Ponovich, one of the great Tadikim of the previous generation. Um, I've heard so many stories about him, and uh, I just, I just love him from his stories. He's great. He's written a uh, great scholar uh, works of. Uh, he's written books on the Talmud called the Yelet Hashacha, one of the greatest Godolim of the generation. His name was Rabbi Aaron the Leib Steinman. And listen to this following story. Okay, it's a family from Nebrak. And you know everyone prays for your children that you want them to go on the in the way of the Torah and mitzvot. And this family, even though he was a rabbi himself, but one of his children living in Bnei Brak, this is just some uh, unknown rabbi. I'm not saying I don't know his name, but one of his children, he is he went off the derech. And what I mean, he became totally not religious. And he started he went out with non Jewish girl, you know for. For a Bnei Brak boy to go out with non-Jewish girls is challenging. It's not like you grow up in London and it's non-Jewish girls everywhere. Everywhere there's Jewish girls. You know, it's it's hard. It's challenging to find. And he was going to marry her. And you know, they told the family. Uh, you know, he had a friend, and his friend said to him, "You know, maybe before you get married, just maybe go uh, tell your family and maybe be with them one time just before the wedding." You know, you still you're giving up all your all your all your heritage. You know. He said, leave me alone. He said, just go. Oh. He convinced him and he said, okay, I'll go for Shabbat. And 
the whole Shabbat, you know, he, he wasn't really involved with the family. You know, everyone's uh, involved with Shabbat. And uh, he's not. He was in his room on his phone the whole time, smoking on Shabbat, on his phone on Shabbat, during the meals, just popping for a few minutes, you know, just to eat. And then everyone's doing singing. He's not really singing or divrei Torah, nothing. Or Bekat Amazon, he walks out, back to his cigarettes on his phone. The whole Shabbat. And the rabbi is there, said, look, this is my son. Yeah. Comes time to Sudash Lishit. And Sudash Lishit, his, um, his father said to him, listen, there's going to be a shiur from the Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Aaron H. Steinman. And he said, do you want to maybe come? Now, it was a bit of a long shot to ask such a thing. But he said, listen, I've got nothing to lose. Everyone goes to hear him. You see, the, when he uh, speaks, it's packed out. You know, hundreds come. He said, Rav Steinman? Yes, I'm coming. And he was like, okay. Baruch Haba, let's get you a kippah. Come. And he was there by the shield. And after the, the shield, they went to approach Rav Steinman. And they said, you mean, this is my son, not religious, going to marry a non-Jew. And he said, okay, let me see him. He said, how are you? Shabbat Shalom. He said, yeah. He said, you used to be you know, a religious boy. He said, yeah. He said, how long, you, how long have you been not religious for? He said, Rabbi, maybe two years. And then he asked him a question. I'm not sure how to say this in English, but he said, tell me during those two years, did you ever have Hir Hore Tshuva? Maybe in English means that. Did you ever have like second thoughts of Teshuva? Did you ever have Hirurim Shel Teshuva? Thinking maybe have I done the wrong thing? Maybe, you know, Hashem wants me to do something else. And he admitted to Rabbi Aaron Shem said, yes, I, I, um, indeed it happened a few times. He said, okay, but can you tell me how long did they last for these thoughts? It is difficult to know, you know, sometimes it's for a couple of minutes, sometimes maybe longer. He said maybe to, in total during those two years, how much in the estimate? He said if you add up all the, uh, maybe maybe 40 minutes. And the rabbi said, wow, 40 minutes of your tshuva? That means for 40 minutes, you reach the place where even tzaddikim don't stand. That's brachot. And he said to him, I'm jealous of you. That's what the rabbi said, and he said, Shabbat Shalom. And he walked off. And that was it. And he came home, and, and he was just thinking the whole time about Rav Steinman. He's the, he's the, the greatest man in the generation, the biggest that they can. And he says that he's jealous of me because I had here away tshuva. And he kept thinking about that again. Um, and he cut off connection straight away Motei Shabbat with this non-Jewish girl. He said, that obviously, this is not for me. And then he made a turnaround. You know, he came slowly, slowly. He came back to Judaism to the Torah, to mitzvot, and he became religious. And all because of Rabbi Aaron Steinman. Now that was the story, how he got to his heart. And tonight is his yard site, so I'm saying this also. But there's a tremendous lesson I wanted to learn from this. How long ago did he die? Sorry. He died maybe two, or maybe three years ago. Okay. Um, uh, maybe two, um, I don't know, maybe three, maybe it was four years ago. I can't remember. Something like that, three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, very old age, 102 something. Um, so that was part one of the story. But part two is why, why would he even go to this the shield? If you're not <laughs> interested just, of Shabbat, you, you're I not had, interested of Suda, why, why did he even go to Rav Steinman? I had this so the story. I had this to take him from his car to a chalea. Oh, wow. Rav Steinman? Yeah, Rav Steinman. Wow. He held my hand and I took wow. him. Right. So, <laughs> big schut that was. So, let me just tell you the first part of the story of Aaron Leib Steinman. When he was, uh, he said, why did he go to the Ibn Nishio? 
So he said, if it's Rav Steinman, it's something special. So he said that he remembers when he was a little boy. Now, when they're a young boy, maybe, you know, at the age of seven or eight, when they start learning Mishnayot. So, you know, my boys are learning Mishnayot. And when they finish learning the Perek, they learn, they study the Mesechet, they learn Baal Peh. Then they go, they take him to the Rosh Hashiva to be tested. Um, you know, it's, you're lucky. It's one of the lucky parts of growing up in Israel. You know, if you go to religious school, they take you to one of the greats in the generation. And they're all lining up. And every boy that came to the Rosh Hashiva, you would ask him a question. What, what are you learning? Can you tell me the Mishnah? You ask him a question. He's a good boy. He gives him a sweet. So he should enjoy the Torah. It should be fun for him. So they all stand in line and everyone gets to his turn until it gets to this boy's turn. This boy there and there wanted to marry a non-Jewish when he was a little boy. He got to his turn. And he got to Rabbi Aaron Leib Steinman and he asked him a question. And he said to him, I don't know. Okay. So he asked him another question, but easier one. You know, let, let the boy get a question, all right? And he said, I don't know. So he asked him an even easier question. And he said, I don't know. He said, okay. Go away. And he carried on. And then he called back the boy. He said, come here. I'm going to give you three sweets. Because in Judaism, Hashem doesn't judge us according to our success. He judges us according to our efforts. And you try three times for the question, and this is for you. Can you see? Can you say this again, please? Ah, welcome, sir. I'm sorry, I, I was in my my work. You know, I came late, so so came quickly. Okay, so just catch the beginning of the story. But the line was that this boy he didn't know the answer to the question three times. Everyone else got a sweet, and Rav Simon said to him, "I'm going to give you three sweets because you should know that what counts is your efforts. It's not your success." And even if you didn't know, that doesn't matter. Because when you try, that's what you're supposed to do. And that's what we have. All we can do is to try. And that's what Hashem wants from us. Please God, we pray that we'll be successful in whatever we do. But we want to try the mitzvah. That's our efforts. That's what we can get price from. And that was Ruven, what he did. He did his mitzvah. That's, Hashem why, he, that's why he wanted to go to Shiel on Matei Shabbat. So when, when we had such good memories of our neighbor Shtam and we're giving him the sweets, he said, this is a special man. And when he gave his shoe on Shabbat, yeah, that's why he went to this shoe because of that reason. And after he spoke to him and he said, listen, I'm jealous of you, of your way tshuva, that's why he left the, the Goya and that's how he came back to be religious. And that was a true story. I had it already two or three times already this week because everyone's talking about our neighbor Shtam and this is a phenomenal story. So it became very famous. But also for us, every effort that we make, it gets counted. That's what gets written down. The fact that Ruven wanted to save Yosef and bring him back to his father, he didn't manage to do that. He wasn't successful, but he wanted to. He tried. That's written in the Torah. That's what we read in the Swiss Parasha. For generations, we're going to read this. And then Medrash says, had he would have known that, he would have done it. Even more he would have done. He would have made sure to carry it to himself. So, so that should give us the chizuk to do more mitzvot, more effort into our mitzvot, even when it's maybe more challenging. And that's what happened in Hanukkah. Um, I'm trying to decide if I should skip a bit or try and squeeze it all in. What do you think? Okay, we'll try. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll fit in. At the end of the parasha, when Yosef is in prison, um, and Yosef says to... The butler, he says, will you remember me and tell Paro to take me out, out of the out of prison? He says to him, you're going to be taken up in three days. When you once you get returned to your position, he says to the Shara Sar Mashkim, Kim Zachatani just remember me. Do me a kindness. And, and just remind Paro, listen, I'm here, I haven't done anything wrong. And get me out of here. I was just stolen and I haven't done nothing wrong. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. No one cares about me. Just put in a good word for me. Okay. 
that that was maybe the right thing to do each tattoo. Hashem zechatani itcha. But Midrash says, okay, we're just gonna, let me just get to the point. Next week's parasha, what happens? Why it takes two years? He's in prison for another two years. Chazal tell us that he was Yosef was in prison for another two years because he asked the butler for his help. And there's many explanations given about this because it says by Yosef, Blessed is the one who trusts in God. And why does he trust the butler? Now, obviously, Yosef at Sadiq was was trusting in Hashem more than anyone can ask. We learn from Yosef about Emunan, about Kadosh Baruch and Bitochon. But on his level, there was something to be judged on. And of course, he did the right thing. That's what anyone's supposed to do. If you get a chance to get out of jail and you've done nothing wrong, of course, ask for whatever help you can get. In any situation, if you have contacts, you have connections, make good use of them. That's normal. That's, that's not against Bitochon. But I saw today, I had today an explanation. And this is a beautiful piece. He said, He waited an extra two years because of this sin. Now, why two years? Why did you punish him for two years to stay in jail? You know, he's been already for 10 years. That's enough time. It's time for him to go out. And really, that was enough time. Oh, it's uh, Rashi says, yeah. Now I get it. Let me just feed you the Rashi. I was looking for this Rashi. says, He did not remember him, and that's why he forgot. Says Rashi, because Yosef trusted in him to remember him, he was forced to be in prison for another two years because of that. Uh, that praise fortune is the man who trusts in God and, and doesn't turn to other, other, other sources. That's why he's in prison for another two years. Okay. So I had a beautiful explanation. So you know what happened over here? Yosef told him you're going to go out in three days, okay? So you got today, and then another two days, and then the third day you come and they are free. So when is he going to mention him to power? When he gets free. When is he going to go to power? In three days, right? So he said in three days. So that means for two days, what was he doing? He was waiting for the butler to speak to Paro. He said, for those two days, he's like, stop praying to Agadish Baruch Hu. When he didn't pray to Agadish Baruch Hu for two days, so it was like Yom Leshana. Two days, two years. Like the, the spies, when they were for 40 days, and they spoke bad about Eretz Israel for 40 days, they were punished 40 years, Yom Lashana in the desert. Same thing with Yosef. He got two years for two days because he didn't pray to Hashem. After that, he saw no one's helping him. Again, he prays to Hashem. But I just want to mention here the concept is what do we pray for? When we get up in the morning, okay, so somebody says, okay, Baruch Hashem, you know, business is good, but, you know, let's pray for, uh, what else do we need, you know, pray for our health. Business is good, we're praying for health. Someone says, listen, uh, Health is okay, Baruch Hashem is okay, but let's pray for Shalom Bayit. Let's pray for business. But that's not the attitude. If something is going good, it's because of it's Hashem. Hashem gave it to you. So I need to pray for everything every day. Does that make sense? So that's what we learn here from Yosef. And when it comes now to the time of Hanukkah, it's a time to thank Hashem and to pray to Hashem. When you're lighting the menorah eight days, Look at them, and it's a very special time in Sugal to pray and to ask Hashem to thank Him for everything. Everything that we've given is a gift, and Hashem can take it all away from us. 
like he gave it to us. So let's remember to thank him for that. You know, I remember one approach to, to prayer. Someone said, you know, I don't know what to pray for. What should I pray for? He said, Baruch Hashem. If you think about that tomorrow, you're only going to get from Hashem what you prayed for today. What would you pray for? Pray for everything. And that, that's really our attitude to be always to rely on Allah Kodesh Baruch in prayer. Okay, now. Got the rest of this. Yeah, let's see, offer a question and then we're going to talk about Bezat Hashem. Is there a certain amount that we should pray for? Like, is there a percentage that we should pray for and a certain percentage that we should be thankful, thankful for in our prayers? Oh, yes, very good question. Yeah. So the way that Amida is broken up is a third, a third, and a third. Okay, there's one third where we, we talk about how great is Hashem. That's the first part. Okay, Abraham, okay, Yitzchak. Uh, we just pray you are the greatness of everything then the middle part of the Shemana is right that's where we ask we ask for Akadosh Baruch Hu for spiritual things and for physical needs we say give us knowledge make us better people forgive us and then we ask for give us good health give us parnasa. we ask Barachenu, Shema Kolein, listen to our prayers. And then the end of the Amidah, we say, Modi Menach Menach. We thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So it always needs to go together. You always need to ask and to thank. Don't just thank, and then just ask. Make sure you always thank, and you also, you ask. Can you recognize that? It's come, everything can come from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Okay. Nice. Um, we are going to skip a little bit, and I'm going to talk about this, what I learned today from the... David Cohen, of Hebron. So, something interesting about the, the, the miracle of, of Hanukkah. We sing Anero Talalu. Anero Talalu, Nachum Adlikim, we say Alani Sim, Balet Eshuot, Balani Flaot. The Ashkenazim say, we say Alami Lchamot. But that's what we're referring to, all the, the miracles of them. And then we say, Kohanecha um, HaKadoshim was the Kohanim, which was the Matityahu and his sons, which were all Kohanim. What's really the significance that they were all Kohanim? And why is Ali Dei Kohanecha? They didn't really do anything. I'm saying the miracle of the oil was because it was a miracle. They didn't do anything. It was Hashem made it. And then we say that the whole point of Hanukkah is Yemei Hanukkah Talalu, Hanukkah Haner Talalu Kodeshem. Ve'el al yoratam bilvad, en anu rishut lishtamesh me'el al yoratam bilvad k'day, lehodot l'shamecha. It's to thank you for your name on your miracles, al nisecha, niflotecha, v'tishuatecha. And that's what the Gemara says in Shabbat, that the whole point of Hanukkah it's, it's not to eat donuts, and it's not to not even to light the menorah. That's not really the point of Hanukkah. The main mitzvah of Hanukkah, and why they made this Yom Tov, is lehodot velahalel, to say thanks and gratitude to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So, first question I'm going to ask is, is, why is that? Why is there no mitzvah of Sudat Chag, of Sudat Hanukkah? Why is that? We have Sudat Purim. It's a major mitzvah of Purim. It's part of the day. And if we don't have a Sudat on Purim, we haven't fulfilled the mitzvah of the day of Purim. And Hanukkah, there's not actually mitzvah to, to eat. No, we have minhag to eat milky foods and oily foods. Minhag, but it's not mitzvah. So that's question number one, and we're going to give two answers to that question. Question number two. Well, that's really question number two. One is, why is it kohanim? What's special about kohanim? Question number two, why do we not have a mitzvah to eat? And we're going to have two two. And two answers for that question. And question number three. And this we're going to have three answers for. This is the Midrash in Hanukkah. It's brought down in this uh, book, a uh, few Midrashim in Hanukkah. The, the same time where Am Yisrael were looking for a savior against the Goyim, which came against them. They came by millions of them again, of Greeks. 
He said to his friends, the Hasmonean, At the same pasuk which we spoke about Yosef, so that's another connection to Hanukkah. Omin Hashem Yisur Libo, Baruch HaGever Hashem Sham Hashem Yiftacho. So blessed is the one who trusts in Hashem. Amale Yafer Malta, he said, you're right. Let's trust in Hashem. Why are we looking for the Goyim to help us? Why are we looking for other saviors? Let's trust in Hashem. Okay, now what do you want to do? There's 10 million of the Greeks. He said, Ani the Shiva Banai, me and my seven sons, you and your three sons, him, you the bet Shiv Teka, like the 12 tribes of uh, Israel. And this is, listen to this line. Says Matityao Kohen Gadol, Muftach Ani, Bakadosh Baruchu, Shiaser Anu Nisim Veniflaot. Can we have a translation for that? Muftach Ani, Bakadosh Baruchu, I trust in God that He's going to do for us miracles. And then they said they fasted, Beyatsumu, Bilbashu Sakim, Vaefer, and they asked for Rachamim for Kadosh Baruchu to save them. And then when they finished to pray, became, they got up from, from, from fasting, from the crying, from the tefillah, and they girded their swords, they put on their whatever armor they had, and then they were lighter than eagles, uh, and more courageous than lions, they fought like lions, and they managed to kill many of them. Okay, so this is question number three. How can you say I trust in God that he's going to do miracles. Can you do that? Is that legal? Can you say, oh, I'm going to believe that Hashem is going to do a miracle for me? I have to say that I'm going to risk myself in danger. I'm going to go out to war with 12 men against 10 million Greeks. And I'll trust that Hashem is going to do a miracle. So that's so, question number uh, three. First of all, we know that the soul the is more than this. Where does that say that? Uh, I, I, I don't remember. Which, okay, uh, I'm going to tell you. Okay, go on. So you're not allowed. So that's the question. So what was he thinking? But yeah, but in, in this case, A is Kohen Gadol. So he's in yes. a slightly different position, yes, to say the least. Maybe. Uh, okay, so he's got a special power. It's uh, the Kohen. He's not a superhero. Yeah, he can't do uh, blind miracles. He's, just, he's a Kohen. He's a religious man. Okay, yeah, what's the uh, other uh, idea? And, and the, sec the second is that, that uh, look, he was. It, it it was like uh, it was like uh, uh, a safe bet. It's like why? Because if because if they don't win, they die either way. Ah, okay. So it's a gamble. Okay, you're saying either it's not, there's no gamble. It's a, it's a hundred percent. It's like when Avram went to fight for Lot. It's hundred yeah. percent. There is no question here. So either they're gonna kill me, or I'm gonna kill them. You know? No, or if, or if not, so I'm I'm dying spiritually. So it doesn't matter. I'm going to die anyway. Okay, what, okay. What, okay. So what, thank. There is. Can, can I say okay, something? I accept the approach. It, yeah, it, I would it, I would like to hear everyone's idea. I just want to summarize the three questions. Okay. So question I, number I, one. Sorry. Just one second, yourself. I want to hear what you have to say. Question number one is why was it talking about Ali Dekoane Chagdoshim? The Kohanim didn't make the miracle of the oil. Why is it going to do that? That's question number one. We're going to give one answer to question number one, two questions to two answers to question number two, and three answers to question number three. So let's remember them. Second question is why Chanukah we don't eat? Why we have a mitzvah to eat on Purim and not on Chanukah? And the third question: How can you be Batuach? The Hashem is going to make you a Nes. So Mechal Nes. How can you do that? Um, and we had the one approach from Gilad, and we'd like to hear from Yosef. Okay, I, 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 about uh, if I'm allowed to say, you know, that I trust that God will do, you know, a, a miracle. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a matter of trust. Okay, so yes. I prefer to say, yes, I believe that Hashem will do it, rather yeah. than saying, you know, I'm not sure if he can do it or not. You know what I mean? Yeah, or of course he can do it, but who said that he wants to do it? Why would Hashem want to do that for you? And we're going to pour, we're going to bring a, a source from the the midrash and sefer. In fact, it's it's halakhically it's it's, it's um, what would you say? It's an illegal move. You can't say to Hashem, "I trust in you, you do for me a miracle." Yeah, God doesn't work for you. Yeah, of course He can do miracles, but no, yeah, but yeah. but it, it, but the miracle is not for them. It's it's what they were fighting for. It's 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 not allowed. It's not allowed when. 
uh, when Hashem has presented you with options and you uh, say to Hashem, like, I'm not going to do what you've given me the op op opportunity to do and I want you to do a miracle. But when Hashem puts you in a corner and all you have is to rely on the miracle, that's when Hashem is saying to you, now is the time to rely on the miracle and pray and trust in Hashem. Okay, so that's very interesting. Like, that, that also follows it's, up. It's like in Chasa Kohen in a way, right? Yeah. What do you mean like Pinchas? It's like Pinchas. What, you you, what, what choice did he have? He said, look, so if you think about it, he did a terrible thing. Well, Kanaim Pogimbo? Yeah. Like didn't, but, didn't no, but it's not that. about Kanaim. It's, it's about, uh, yeah, but there was no one else to, to, to stand up. Okay, but it. he didn't have to do it. He could have just stood aside. No one would have heard him. You know, it yeah, would have been fine. Like, but it's not he wouldn't have been be punished. No, that's the thing. Pinchas would not have been punished if he wouldn't have done anything. He wouldn't have been rewarded, but he wouldn't have been punished. But you're good. You're saying good. Uh, you guy also, Mayor. Does anyone have anything else to add, or we're gonna we share with you what the Rob David Cohen said? No. Any ideas, Joe? I missed the beginning. I was feeding the baby. <laughs> uh, we just we just asked uh, three quest short questions. And w why is the miracle depending on the Kohanim? Second question is why don't we eat on Hanukkah like we eat on Purim? Why is there no mitzvah to eat? And third question is. Why did the Matitiao say that he's going to rely on a miracle? He said, I trust in God to save me. How can you rely on a miracle to be saved? That's question number three. So please, God, we're going to give this option three answers to that question. So let me introduce, first of all, the, the source for the, the prohibition to rely on the miracle. It says the Sifra and Vayikra, Velo Techalelu. Shomea ni mashma nemar, Velo Techalelu emor kadosh, Venikadashti, which says, and then he says, Mikan, Amu Kola Moser at Small Manat La Sotones, and Osin Lones. It's even more than that. He said, If you give up your life for a miracle, then they're not going to do a miracle for you. And if you're willing to give up your life, Shalola Sotones, as a sin lones. And where do we see that from? We see Hanania and Mishael and Azaria. They said, you want to throw us in a fire, we're going. They didn't think there was going to be a miracle. They just said, listen, I'm not going to bow down. I'm going to go into the fire. Avraham Avinu. He said, I'm going to go into the fire. It doesn't matter, Ness. And Hashem made it from a Ness. For Avraham, he made a Ness. And for Hanan and Mishael, he made a Although, although they did pray. Of course, they prayed. But they didn't, they didn't rely on the Ness. And you see, here, they were willing to go up even for somebody. This is the Madrash says, if you are... If you go and, and risk your life and relying on a miracle, you will not be saved. The miracle will not happen to you. It will not be done. And if you don't go for a miracle, then a miracle will happen to you. That's what happens or could happen to you. Yeah? So here, yeah. Matitiao said, I'm going in and I'm, and I'm sure that God is going to do us for a miracle. How can he say that? And why is Hashem helping him? Yeah, because this different to Haran. Thing. Haran, the brother of Avraham Avinu. I think this is testing, testing him, uh, yeah. testing Hashem, you know what I mean? Which is not allowed. Exactly. Not allowed to test Hashem. And he also, you see, by Avraham Avinu, when Haran was there, Haran, his brother, you know, he was there watching Nimrod. And Nimrod was saying, uh, Avraham, I'm going, I'm going to throw you, throw you into the fire if you're not going to, you know, bow down to the idol. He said, do whatever you want. And Aaron said he was like waiting to see. He said, if Avram wins, I'm going to be with Avram. If Aaron, if Nimrod wins, I'm with Nimrod. And he saw Avraham got saved from the fire. So he said, okay, I'm with Avram. He said, you're with Avram, you go into the fire. And he wasn't saved. And this is part of the Midrash. You can't do that. So what's the story with the Maccabim here? How can he done that? So we have one approach from Gilad and then from here. I'm going to share with you. The following idea, and it's fact based on the Gemara Ibrahot. Amalei Rafapel Abaya. He asked the similar question. He said, "My Shana Rishonim de Trachish Lehunisa. Why, why you see in in the the earlier generations they used to have do miracles, and we we don't have miracles. Why not? Why why are we less than they are? We just as good, or we are even better?" And he says, "If you there say are, that, there are miracles." Like, yeah, Sorry, we're, we're quoting a Gemara in Brachot. Now, the time of the Talmud, we're talking about in a period of history, maybe 2,000 I, years ago. Okay. I have the question to the, I have the answer to the question as to why there aren't 
why we don't see any miracles anymore. Okay, so, well, uh, what, uh, let me just say, let's say the question, and we're gonna hear your sorry, sorry. So, so why, why would the generation before us, in the Talmud, in the Gemara, they had easily miracles, and we, we don't have miracles? Now, if you say they're greater than us, so listen, we study much more than they do. They study just Nezikin, we study Shisha Sidrim. Six times more. Uh, they had one, one, it gives a few examples. They had uh, one Mesecha, we had 13 Mesecha. We learned much more than them. But look what happened. Rabbi Yoda, in the generation before us, when he needed rain, he just took off one shoe, made himself a little bit uncomfortable, the rain comes pouring down. He said, we, we cry, we shout, we fast. Mitzahalin, nafshan, nothing happens. Why don't we have miracles? Okay, Joe, let's see your approach. So, yeah, there are miracles. We just yes. don't see them. Nahon, that is true. But he's and, asking and another question. thing. Go on, second thing. It, it, although we may pray harder than people previously, than Jews previously, Perhaps it's the world that is, there's more tuma in the world. So it's not necessarily the person, the individual, it's the right. surrounding and what we're living in, the material. Okay. So, no, and also they had the, the Shema Forash, and there, there were different things, right? It's, uh, it's not only that. I know, but here we're talking a period of history of the Talmud. So it's talking about just difference between one generation and another generation. In the Talmud itself. Yeah, but so Khurban Betamikdash, we know that it's uh, it's gone. It's, uh... Yeah, but even after the Khurban, it wasn't even talking about the time of Khurban. You're talking about you and Joe talking about the Khurban Betamikdash, you're right. That's true, but we're talking about something else. We're not talking about daily miracles. Of course, there's many miracles. We're talking about open miracles that you just come out rain and you just make uh, all your uh, vinegar burn and you walk through like, fires and like, 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 you revive the dead. Like, miracles the of the river to split and it just split. Yeah, there, there are miracle stories in the Gemara. Now, if, is Yaakov still on the shield? Where is Yaakov? Yaakov in Morocco. There was yeah. miracle stories. Can you tell me stories of Morocco and the miracles? Of course. Of course. Now, this is a question I had in yeshiva, okay? I, I went to Ashkenaz yeshiva from Big Tamidei Chachamim in Poland and Hungary. Yeah? And I always wondered, you know, when I was growing in, uh, in part of the we have Hilula, Baba Sali, Hilula, Rabbi Yaakov, Hilula, Rabbi Yitzchak, Hilula. There's many miracles, yeah, Mama? Yeah. Many, many miracles. Open miracles, not just that. And you got there, and they tell you nice stories of tzaddikim, but not miracles. And I always had this question, you know, where, why? Why in Morocco they have miracles and in Hungary and Poland they didn't have miracles? Ah, they had the Maral and the... Uh, oh, they had the big tzaddikim, big Talmud Chachamim. No the Baal Shem Tov. Uh... Yep, yeah, the Baal Shem Tov maybe was an exception. Maybe he was Moroccan, Baal Shem Tov. I don't know. But that was my question, okay? The, 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 uh, there, was the, the, there was the Golem. The Golem. The Golem. The Maral made the Golem. The Maral made Prague, of course. So let me tell you what the Gemara, on the answer of the Gemara. The Gemara says, you know why we don't have miracles? It says, Kamai have a Kamasri Nafshaya Kiddush Hashem. Anand lo Masrina Nafshaya Kiddush Hashem. That's the one line. Doesn't matter how much Gemara you learn or how much Torah you study, how much, you know, it's not good being Tzadik or not. It's Maser Nefesh a Kiddushat Hashem. Which means, uh, maybe literally means, Maser uh, Nefesh, maybe giving up uh, your, from your life or, or sacrificing life or maybe make yourself uncomfortable for Kiddush Hashem. That's what it means. That's what they used to do in the previous generation. And the Gemara gives a few examples as well from that. He said, if you want to have a miracle, you need to be Moser Nefesh. Now, I remember, I remember, uh, so we can do a lot of stories from Tzadikim from Morocco and Baba Sadi. But I remember saying this to Rav Simoni, you're living in Haonov. He lives today in Haonov. And he's telling me, he said, listen, I'll tell you a story from my grandmother. Now, my grandmother, she, you know, she was a Tzadika from Morocco. She wasn't a famous uh, Mama Sulika, but she was, you know, normal people, one of the good uh, tzaddikim in Morocco. He said when she was a young girl, what do you mean she was like a teenager, and she went to the market, uh, I don't know, to buy some oranges or whatever, she was going to the shuk, and he said one of the Arabs, he touched her on her arm, and for his personal enjoyment, he was touching her arm. He said she came home, she took a fire, and she burned her arm, where he touched it just because he was sick that a boy touched her body. 
Now, you ask me, is that halacha? It's not halacha. You don't have to do that. That's not something you have to do. But the way that they lived with Kedusha, they lived, they did for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Mesut Nefesh. He said they had miracles all the time. He said, not only the great, all the time they came, always had miracles, because that's that was the atmosphere in Morocco. You must say, I'm sorry for Kedush Hashem. He said, that was what the Gemara said. It says in the which means Am Yisrael is two ways to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu. There's a way of Teva, he calls it Malchut, and Tiferet, which is Ma'ala Teva, above the Teva. He said, how are you going to get miracles? He said, the Pshayat Gemara is, Hashem Tzilcha Liyadi Minecha, which means God is the shadow of your hand. The way you move, that is how way your shadow moves. The shadow responds to your hand. It says, the way you act to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, B'Misirut Nefesh. What's mean Misirut Nefesh? Misirut Nefesh means, uh, I'm tired, uh, I had a long day, I'm going to sleep, I'm not going to the Shio. Okay, that's Teva, you're Patu. Ma'ala Teva says, what do you mean I'm tired? I'm not missing my Shio. Ah, I'm going to get a coffee, I'm going to wake up, uh, I'm going to get my Shio to run. Okay. Oh, it's Daka, I don't have money in my pocket, I'm Patu. Okay, but no, I want to give to Daka. Uh, can I borrow somebody to give me a five? I want to give to Daka. If you go out the extra step, that is Moser Nefesh for Kedush Hashem. That is where you get miracles. When you do something a bit extra, you've been offended by somebody deeply. But you don't want to speak to him anymore. Okay? Maybe you're right. Maybe he deserves you never speak to him again. But if you're Mochel, you go a bit extra, a Me'ala Teva, something which is unnatural, and forgive where you are right and you don't, he doesn't deserve to be forgiven, and you do forgive. That's ma'ala teva. When you do ma'ala teva, then you get a miracle. Okay, so let's try and we're gonna skip to the end of the share because you're already getting late. That is how he explains the gemara, and he said that's what happened here with the with the miracle of of Hanukkah. He said they made the extra effort to go and to find the oil. They went the extra effort to go and risk their life in the war. And that's how they were zochah to the miracles. Says the Bach, the Bach in Orach Haim, Siman Tafresh Ayin. He asked the question, he said, why in Chanukah there's, we don't eat, we, we don't drink, and there's no mitzvah, and in Purim there is. He said, on Purim, the main gezera was to be killed. Haman wanted to destroy all of Am Yisrael. Men, women, and children. Our bodies were in danger. Well, our bodies were in danger with them we eat. Machila vishtiya. He says in Chanukah, nobody was in danger. You can live. Just don't be religious. You want to eat, you drink, that. And he said, why was that? He says the Bach, and this is the famous line of the Bach. He says, Chanukah, ikar gzera ita al sheitrashlu ba'avoda. They couldn't be bothered to study Torah, to do mitzvot. It rashlu ba'avoda. Alken ata gzera levatel me ma'avoda. He said, you don't want avodat ha'kodesh? You're not interested in the Torah and mitzvot? I'm going to take away from you. Gazar alem otu ha'rasha levatel. He said, okay, forget the Beit HaMikdash. We're going to make everything tame. And they had to be moser nefesh and to, to go out of their way to try and fight for it. They didn't have to fight for it. But when you show that it's important for me, something's not important for you, don't fight for it. So it's not worth a fight. Just forget it. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to go to court for, for 45p. Forget it. Hey, if it's 45,000 pounds, I'm going to go to court. I'm going to fight. If it's not important for you, don't fight for it. He said that they needed to go and fight for the right to be Jewish and to study Torah and to do mitzvot. Because that was what they did wrong in the beginning. He said, okay. So then when you get rewarded with the Chag, the Chag is go just to Avodah. To do the worst service of Hashem. And Avodah is Avodah Shebalev. That's Lehodot or Lehalen. That says the Bach. So now we've given a, an answer to the question we asked why on Purim there is no Suda? Uh, there is a Suda on Hanukkah, there's no Suda. Uh, okay. So I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna skip a bit and I'm gonna try and wrap up in the next few minutes because I know it's getting late. And I promised you three answers, okay. A 
Kohen, we said, Shulchan Aruch says, in, in Hanukkah we say in Arachaman, we ask El Anunisim, Moshe Asa Be'amim Ahem. If somebody forgets to say El Anunisim, then he can say, Arachaman, we ask El Anunisim, Moshe Asa Be'amim Ahem. We pray that Hashem should do for us miracles. And the Shulchan Shuvah asks the question, how can you ask from Hashem to do you a miracle? Can you ask Hashem to do you a miracle? No. No, what do you say, Joe? You are, let's say your wife is expecting, yeah, and let's say she has a girl, and uh, you say to Hashem, I want a boy. Please, Hashem, can I have a boy? Are you allowed to pray for Hashem to give you a boy? No, you're not allowed to do that. Why? You're not allowed to do that. Why? Says, you're not allowed... You get what you're given. No, you can pray before. You should be grateful for what you're given. That's after you get given. But before she's expecting you, of course, you can pray for a boy. Maybe some plan. You should have prayed for a boy. But well, after she's expecting, you say you shouldn't pray for the boy. Should for right. before she's pregnant or right. the first forty days. After mm. forty days, says the Shulchan Aruch is tefillat shav. Um, it's a uh, tefillat shav. Can you translate for, for me? Um, it's false. It's wasted. Yeah, it's maybe a wasted or a false prayer. That's not something which you pray for. It's you pray for something which is future. For future, you pray for. Okay, you thank for the past. You like you said, you're grateful for your given, and you pray for the future. So the question is as follows: Is that why then in the Alanisim would we pray for make us miracles? And this is the question which is brought here in the Shari Tshuva, and he gives two answers. And this is also going to answer our question of Mati Tiyahu as well. Why did he? So confident that he's asking for a miracle. And he gives us two answers. First answer he gives like this. He says, when we ask on behalf of Am Yisrael, Belashon Rabin, then you can ask for a miracle. So you personally cannot ask for a personal miracle. Who says you deserve a miracle? Who are you? You might be a good Jew, but it's not enough to make a miracle. But if you ask on behalf of all of Am Yisrael, Arachaman, who yaseh lanu nisim, for all of Am Yisrael, then you can ask for a miracle. Then you can ask for Hashem to change. But on your own merit, you can't do that. That's question number one. The answer number one. And the answer number two he gives, he says, when you're asking for a miracle, maybe this has got to do what Joe said in the beginning. There's, there's natural miracles and there's unnatural miracles. Okay, what do we mean by natural miracle? It means a, a, a girl of a, over the age, you know, she's 35, she's never been married, then... Okay, she gets engaged, she gets married, Mazal Tov, we're very happy for her. Okay, somebody told me today, go 43 years old, go engaged, and she's going to marry. Baruch Hashem, that's a miracle. But it's not a supernatural miracle, it's a natural miracle. So for a natural miracle, you're allowed to pray for. When we ask for Nisi, you know, a person doesn't have children for 10 years. They have children, it's a miracle. But it can be natural. So for natural miracles, you're allowed to pray for. That's the second answer. Supernatural miracles, you're not allowed to pray for. You can't change nature from a girl to a boy, from a boy to a girl, you can't do that. So here we have two answers. Um, two answers for, for Matityahu. When Matityahu came, and he said, I, I trust that Hashem is going to do for us a miracle. Why? Because I'm asking for Am Israel. It's not for me. I'm not fighting for myself. Look, why, why they're not fighting? Because they're fine. I'm fighting for all of Israel for our heritage. That is okay. You can rely on for miracle. You can pray for a miracle. And second thing is changing in nature. What did Matityahu say? Listen, I just want to kill more the, more people than usual. Give me, uh, don't make change nature and do that. Make it natural. And I heard one of the sources, what did they do? Archmen, the Greeks, they came with uh, archers, the bows, and maybe, I don't know, 10,000 men shot arrows into the air. And there came a wind, blew it back, and, and all the arrows went back on, the, on their Greeks. And they, they just, they killed themselves. So that was the wind. It can happen in the, it wasn't a change in the nature. So that's something we can pray for. That was the two, two answers. Also, yeah. That reminds so, me of the, the dying but, but, but the explanation of, of dying on Kiddush Hashem, 
And for oh. that, actually expecting to see miracles, that, that's a hard one. No, that's not allowed. Yeah, that still remains. You're not allowed to do that. Um, and maybe, well, maybe wait for the third answer. I promised you the third answer. So I'm going to give you this third answer. This is brought down from Rab Al-Khanan Vassalman. Al-Khanan Vassalman, he lived in the times of the First World War, times of Hafez Chaim. Um, and he brings down from the Lavush, which is it's just an earlier commentary. Um, and I must say, the first time I heard this is from my mom. She uh, she she should be for a foie for her. She heard this from from all my tents. And this is a beautiful piece. But I saw it inside today for the first time. And he asked both questions. He asked why Hanukkah there's no there's no food there's no mitzvah for food and Purim there is a big mitzvah and mishteh. So we gave one answer of the Bach. Um, and here gives an, a second answer. Says the Levush, Bigzerat Haman was on the bodies to kill all the bodies. Laog will abid. Bigzerat Antiochus Ayarakala Nefashot was only on the souls. And he says, Look what happens. When, when the time of Haman, what did they do? They didn't make an army. There wasn't any Matityahu. There wasn't any. What did they do? Tsumo alai, go fast, go pray. That was it. Everyone's in a synagogue and you're just praying and you just, uh, and that's enough. But in Hanukkah, that wasn't enough. Of course, they prayed and they fasted and they prayed, but that wasn't enough. They needed to go out and fight. And, and, and why is that? In Haman, they didn't do that. They weren't willing to fight. And it was enough just to, to faith and trust in God and to cry out. And with Antiochus, even though they prayed and they fight it, there was enough and they went out to war. And they risked their life, it was dangerous. So he he brings down from the Levush, it's, it's very interesting, uh, maybe uh, you saw it, and maybe this is also why we answer one of the questions. He said, when, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu is punishing you uh, and your life is in danger. So that is just a way to make you do Teshuvah. If your body is in danger, so do Teshuvah and then Hashem will take away from you. And that's all you need to do, fast and pray. Because it's just between you and God. But he said, if the Satan is involved, this is how he calls it, if the Satan is involved. And means the Satan, he doesn't go for your body. He goes for something which is more valuable. So he goes for, for your neshama. If he's making you doing sinning, sins, and that's what the Greeks did, take away that from us the Torah. If the Satan is involved, it's not enough just to pray. You need to go and fight. And when you fight, then Hashem will help you. But you need to show Hashem that you really want it. Because Hashem is not going to do it for you in a miracle. You're praying, that's not enough. If you want it, or you want it badly, you need to show, show uh, Hashem that you want the mitzvah. That's what they did. So when they had, uh, maybe that's what may have meant, there was no the option of not fighting. You have to fight because this is a satan in the vault. You're, you're fighting for your religion. It's not enough just to die and kill us, Hashem. Yeah, you have to fight for it. It's not enough just to pray. You have to fight. But how, how, have, do, how would you know you have to if, fight, if you look enough. at Purim, for example? No, so that's what he's making a difference. Very spe specific difference. If it's against your body, then you just need to pray and fast and do Teshuvah. If it's against your soul, they're taking away your mitzvot, they're not letting you to study Torah, then you go and fight. That has to take action. But is, even when it's, it's against your body, you're obliged to do your, your own ishtadut, your own, to, to, to take your own actions, right? To take your own actions to protect, but yeah. not to go fight. That's what he's saying. If it's a the gezera is only on your body, then you know it's from in Ashamayim. Let me give you another, another There's something which is called a bit deeper. It's called itaruta deletata, itaruta ledeleela. Itarut deletata means when you're more down in this world. And itaruta deleleela is when you're more in Shamayim. Now, in Hanukkah, you have a, a dreidel, okay? It's a figurative, but when you spin it, you spin it from, from the top, yeah? And it turns around on the bottom, right? And in Purim, you spin from the bottom and it turns around on the top. 
So when you pray, and in Shamaim they turn around everything, and Haman, uh, he he just changes his mind. You know, the, they hang him up on the tree, Achasveres makes the switch, and that's it. There's no open supernatural miracles. Because you prayed, and everything happens in Shamaim, they turn it around. But in Hanukkah, it was spinning down here, the dreidel, right? They went out to fight. There was major miracles that were just going on. And that needs to be done because that was against our religion. So this goes back to what we started off this year. When you have to make an effort, when you're doing the mitzvot, you have to show Tashem, this is the mitzvot nefesh. Oh, so maybe let's answer the, the first uh, the three, the three questions that we had. Question number one, why is the Kohanim? A Kohen, we said in last week's shiur, a Kohen is Boter, but has Bitachon. Kohen is Gematria, Bitachon. Also, we said in today's shiur that when you go uh, above what's your natural expected of you, that's how you zoche, that's how you merit a miracle. You can only ask for a miracle when you're going extra, you have the Anaga, doing extra something, you do more than what you naturally expected of you, then you can expect for a pray for a miracle. That was the levush. That's the hanaga of Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Hashem tilchale dimenecha is your shadow. A kohen, you represent that which is above. In the natural world, you have seven because we have six dimensions with the four directions and up and down. That's six dimensions, and the seventh dimension just puts it all together. That's called number seven. Eight is supernatural. That's why the days of Hanukkah is eight. It represents supernatural. So in between the natural and the supernatural, between seven and eight is seven and a half, okay? Kohen is gematria. Bitachon is. Bitachon, but what's the number? 75. 75 is in between the natural and the supernatural. That's what the, the Kohen does. He goes above the, the nature. And he's the connector between you and God. He's your shliach. The coin is like the, the rabbi. He's a teacher. He's the one who's studying. And he's the one who's representing your shliach. So let's just wrap up. That is the first question. Why would we say Alidei Kohanech Adidashim? Because the Kohanim, they were Moser Nefesh to fight, to go find the oil. That's how they made the miracle. Because of the Mesirut Nefesh, like Reuven, we saw. Um, like the effort, we said the story of Steinman. When you make the effort, that's what counts. And the second question is, what's the difference between Hanukkah and Purim? So we said Hanukkah was, they didn't uh, have uh, two answers we gave. With the Mitrashel Me Avoda, the Bach, they didn't do the Avoda, they didn't show that they cared about the Avoda. That was what was important for them. So um, the Tikkun for that is the Avoda, is the, the Avoda, the Tefillah prayer. In Purim, they ate from the soda, they, bought, they were risking their lives for it. And that's how they connect. They can correct it by eating in kosher way, in the way of mitzvot. And the second answer we gave was uh, Rabbi Lachanan. Then Purim, the bodies were in danger, so the bodies eat. Here, Hanukkah, our body was, wasn't in danger. Our souls was in danger. So that's why our soul is what speaks. Having said that, even though there was no mitzvah to have soda, the tradition is we do have uh, family Hanukkah parties. Um, but the main purpose of the party is maybe not the oily food or the milky food, but it's the lehodot lehalel. Make sure when you ever have a gathering, you light the menorah. Does it mean so you light the menorah at a gathering? And you, and you talk about the nisim, talk about the miracles, even private personal miracles. Every time in Hanukkah, you always have an es Hanukkah. Hey, by Amir Ma'im Bizman, you ask for that, you see that. And then you makadish the whole seudah. And the third question and the three answers was, how could you rely on the miracle? You can't ask for a miracle. You can't pray for a miracle. So we gave three answers. Number one, we said, if you ask for collectively, for Am Yisrael, for Rabim, then you can pray for a miracle. And in fact, that's what he did. He said, I'm, I'm fighting for Am Yisrael. Second answer is, if, if it's an open miracle, which is natural, then you can ask for, for the miracle. But sorry, when it's a natural miracle, then you can ask for it. But if it's a supernatural to change male to female, that you can't ask for. And the third answer is really what maybe what Maya said in the beginning. When you're forced to fight, then you fight and you ask for an S. When they had no choice over here. He said, I know that when they're asking, fighting against our souls, we have to fight. If we have to fight, I'm sure Hashem is going to help us because he's not going to make us an obligate, obligate us to fight without providing us with a miracle. 
And that's how he said it. So in his circumstances, when he was when he was forced to fight, um, and it wasn't just to pray, it wasn't enough to pray, he had to fight, and he knew that he had to fight, then he knew that he would be saved by Kalash Baruch So we have a lot to learn for, but Bezat Hashem, in this time of Hanukkah, when we light tomorrow, let's remember the miracles, and why we got the miracles, because we did Moser Nefesh, like they did in Morocco, like they did in the times of the Gemara. When we Moser Nefesh for Mitzvot, and we make that extra effort, that's how we be zochet to miracles. And that's, uh, we thank Hashem for the miracles that he's given us. So I hope you enjoyed the shiur. And I think it's your night. And maybe, if you want to do, we'll do maybe a short uh, five minutes of uh, halacha. If you have time. I, I, I see, I can see you're all tired. It's already been a long day. <laughs> but everybody's uh, invited for five minutes. If you want to do the, 